we have sound. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody. <clears throat> Did anybody know it rained last night? I think we heard that already. I, I really didn't know it rained last night. When I went to bed at 10 o'clock, 10.30, the storms were all south of us, and it looked like no rain, and it's like, I mean, in, in the last week, you all had like three and a half inches here. We've had zero in rain. Got up this morning at 530, and on the window, there was rain. That's when I knew it was raining. And I went out and turned the lights on on the deck, pulled the shade. Four drops. <laughs> I guess we're just not living right out east of town. But, uh, anyway, it rained last night. It cooled down, though. Mm -hmm. Praise God, it cooled down. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We just thank you for the encouragement that you give us. It's truly, you encourage us day by day. Father, just we pray now that you would uh, be with the speaker as he uh, ministers. Guide his conversation and thoughts. We commit ourselves in a worthy and precious name of your son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That song that Danny had us sing, the first one, Amazing Grace, I think I probably said this before. You can't really appreciate that song until you know the story of John Newton and what an absolute train wreck he was. And then the Lord literally saving him out of the holes of slave ships to be an individual that would write so many blessed songs mm. and to be such an encouragement. But thank you, Danny, for that, that song this morning. Um, Charles M. Russell, you all know him, the famous painter and sculptor of Western art, once made this statement. You can see what man made from the seat of an automobile. But the best way to see what God made is from the back of a horse. I can attest to the truth to that. Uh, if you all would like to be blessed with a view of what God created, drive about 50 or 60 miles east, northeast of here, get up on a high hill off of the highway, get out of your car, and look at the Flint Hills. That is one of the most amazing creations of creation in, in Karen and I's mind. I, uh, I think that probably is because as a, a young man growing up, I had the wonderful privilege of spending many hours on the back of a horse riding the Flint Hills. But there is nothing like it in the world. I'm sure you all knew that. Blue stem grass and the Flint Hills is unique to Kansas and northern Oklahoma. There is nothing else like it in the world. And what makes it so unbelievable is that the Flint Hills absolutely cannot grow anything. With the Flint rock, with the soil composition and so forth, it is worthless for anything. And my point here is the amazingness of God's creation. It is worthless for nothing except blue stem grass. And it just so happens that blue stem grass is one of the most productive grasses in raising cattle. Now you've had your history lesson. <laughs> I had a young man ask me once as he was viewing the Flint Hills, who planted all of this grass? <laughs> True question. My answer was, God when he created it. it. It was there when it started and it's still there today. So a little, just a little side note. Love the Flint Hills. Lord willing, this morning we will finish up the seven churches of Revelation with our look at the church in Philadelphia. You realize we've been at this since late 2019 almost two years. 
My, hasn't the world changed in the last two years? When I started this series, if I could have had the ability to look into the future and see where we are today as a world and as a country, I would say, nah. Nah, impossible. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are today, two years later. Mm -hmm. I think that the view of the seven churches is a very appropriate study to have taken place during that time because we have seen so many things happening, especially in our own country, that we would have said never would happen, has happened. And in Scripture, it talks about what Christians have to endure in different times and different places. Turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. And basically this morning, we're just going to kind of do a, a verse by verse look at that in the time that we have. Revelation chapter 3, put in a reading in at verse 7. And, to the, and by the way, as we read this, you're going to see, as we have with the other six churches, a consistency, an outline of all of the churches as to what transpires throughout the portion of the description of that given church. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Church of Philadelphia was located in Lydia, some 28 miles southeast of Sardis, and was named after the, a king of Pergamos. So all those names, isn't that interesting? We've had all those names as we've looked at seven churches. Adelus Philadelphus, who built the city. The city today is called Alisar, located in the Asian region of Turkey. So that's where it is. It's not Philadelphia anymore. It goes by another name. Philadelphia several times was almost completely destroyed by earthquakes. But through the centuries, there has been a nominal, get that word, a nominal Christian testimony in Philadelphia that has prospered even to this day under Turkish rule. <clears throat> Today, the town of Alisar has a population of about 45,000 people. Put this in your mind. About the size of Hutchison, maybe just a tad bigger, about the size of Salina. That town of 45,000 people has 45 mosques, Muslim mosques. Can you imagine 45 assemblies in Hutchison, Kansas, or in Salina, Kansas? That ought to speak to us about the fervency of our faith. 45 mosques. Now that's Turkey, but this is the United States. 
This is a Christian country. That's a Muslim country. Still, something's lacking. Something is lacking. Dan used Strong's this morning, so I've got to try to keep up with him somehow. Strong's number 5359, that word Philadelphia means brotherly love. In both the Hebrew and in the Greek when you expand the Greek, it means the city of him who loves his brother. The New Testament describes Philadelphia, that word Philadelphia, of the love which Christians who cherish each other, the love that they have for the brethren. <clears throat> the word's found six times, six other times in the New Testament. And every time it references brotherly love. So when you read Romans 12.10, 1 Thessalonians 4.9, Hebrews 13.1, 1 Peter 1.22, and twice in 2 Peter 1.7, you're going to see the word brotherly love. That word in the Greek is Philadelphia. In Revelation, it occurs for the seventh time. Perfect number, I guess. But only here is it used to describe a city, the city which bears its name. The letter addressed the church at Philadelphia and has that unusual characteristic when you look at the seven churches of being entirely a letter of praise. When you look at the churches, the Lord says, I know thy works and you something, but then I have somewhat against thee. You will not find that in the church in Philadelphia. You also will not find that in the church of Smyrna. There's an interesting uh, correlation between those two churches. So Philadelphia and Smyrna had mostly praise. And that contrasts very sharply with Sardis and Laodicea, that the Lord really didn't have any praise for at all in some of the works, but basically in their denial of the faith. Keep this in mind as we look at the finality of the book of Philadelphia. It has the view of the rapture of the church in its uh, uh, sight. As you read through it, and as we make application to where we are today, the view of the rapture is very clearly a part of the ministry of this letter. <clears throat> when he talks about, when Christ talks about in the letter to Philadelphia, he portrays it not as a series of separate events leading up to the rapture, but he in essence portrays it as the expectation of the rapture as being constant. Dan was talking this morning about, you know, we're not believers on Wednesday night and Sunday mornings. We're believers 24-7, 365. Too often, I think, we consider the potential for the rapture as saying, that's some point in the future. And we're famous for saying, well, this has to be in place. This event has to be in place. This, e no, no, that's not true. The rapture is going to occur when the father tells the son, go get your bride. And so just as we should 24-7, 365, be involved in worship, we should also 24-7, 365, expect momentarily the rapture. Lord willing, I will not finish this message today. I don't know if you all have ever seen, there is a video out. It's been around a long, long time. One, sometimes I'll have John play it up here. This preacher is preaching and there's a whole big church and a whole bunch of young people and everything and he's going on and talking about Christ and talking and all of a sudden there's a boom. and there's only about 
a fourth to a third of the people left. It shows where the speaker was and his Bible is laying on the floor. The rapture has occurred and it shows the reaction of those people who were left. It, it, it is really a striking video. So Lord willing, that will happen this morning. And none of us will be left here, but we'll all be taken at the same time. Just as the rapture was historically true for the Church of Philadelphia, it is true for all believing churches, saints, which is the church today, around the world, and especially for us. Okay, for the balance of the time, let's tie into this letter and get this wrapped up, pulled together as best as we can. Verse 7, chapter 3 of Revelation. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, and catch this description, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. We see here the qualifications of our Savior. He is holy. He is true. You can't have one without the other, beloved. You've got to have both. And what does it say? Let's see, where are we at? In 1 Peter chapter 1. Be ye holy, for I am holy. If we are his, and I trust that we are, then, beloved, we are holy before a holy God. And that allows us to have commune with him. And there's only one who is true. And we know that from Scripture. And I could go to several verses to prove that. But Christ is truth. I think sometimes, be careful, Jim. I think sometimes we don't believe that. If we in our heart of hearts would confess, sometimes we say, ah, there's something a little out of culture there. Beloved, it cannot be that way. He is absolute truth. And he is absolute holiness. And I think the reason we get sucked into that sometimes is the opposite of truth is false and that that is perverted. And we are inundated with the false and the perverted in this world today. And yet we have that one shining light of one who is absolutely true in all of it. Concerning that portion where it says, He hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth no man opens. We first see this scripture in Isaiah 22, where Isaiah is writing about Eliakim, who's described as being the father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. He writes in verse 22, And the key of the house of David will lay upon his shoulder, so shall he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Eliakim held the key to the king's treasury. When he opened that door, nobody, nobody closed it except him. But when he shut that door, nobody opened it except him. That should be tremendous encouragement to us because as we look from prophecy to where we're at in Revelation, we're reading the description of the same thing of the Lord. He holds the key and he opens and he shuts. Let's make personal application here. This meeting of believers is the Lord's meeting. It's not our meeting. Won't be to any of us that have a thought in our mind, are we going to shut the door someday? We don't have that privilege, beloved. It's not ours to raise the question. 
Only the Lord opens and only the Lord closes. Only the Lord removes the candlestick, period. I don't care if there's two of us sitting in here or if there's 220 of us sitting in here, this is a meeting that the Lord has called. Amen. Not Mike, John, Whitney, Dan. No, this is the Lord's meeting. And we need to be encouraged that as long as we maintain our doctrinal truth and as we maintain our purity towards him, he will not shut the door, and we need to go through it rapidly because he has it open for us. Let's get that mindset. The door is open for us to go through. Amen. Trust me, if the Lord closes the door, he'll let us know. He'll let us know. One thing, <clears throat> talking about him holding the keys, it's interesting that in Revelation 1.18, it also says this, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys to hell and death. We just saw where he had the keys to what I would consider life, open doors and opportunities. We well, also holds the key to hell and death. Beloved, he holds the keys to everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. And again, we need to acknowledge that. Verse 8. I know thy works, and behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. He opens and shuts, right? He turns right around and he tells them, I open before thee and I open an open door and no man can shut it. And then he goes on to describe the church of Philadelphia as having little strength. The rendering there is it's a small church. Not big numbers. It's a small church. But it is a faithful church. By the way, I was... Truly blessed this morning when we came together for remembrance meeting. We're all over here. We were packed. Okay? We were packed. Yet we were still small in number. But it, there was so much power in that remembrance meeting. That's the blessing that even small numbers can bring. It's not about the numbers. It's about our walk. It's about our faithfulness to the Lord. I'm going to have to get off that horse. I apologize about that. The Lord affirms Philadelphia's positive work. He says, I know your works. You know, Jesus Christ knows the works of the believer at Westside Bible Chapel. Every one of us. He knows exactly what's in our heart. He knows exactly what's in our mind. And he knows our works. I trust that would be a tremendous encouragement to us and not shame in him knowing something that we really wouldn't want him to know that would not please him. He describes Philadelphia as having little strength, being small, only a little power, but boy, they use that power to good effect. You don't have to have a lot of power to be effective. You just have to be faithful to be effective because in reality the power comes from the Lord, not from us individually. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them the of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. You know, in the seven churches, this is the second time that phrase synagogue of Satan has been used. And it also is the fourth time that Satan is referenced. 
The seven churches, just like the true church today, takes a beating from the world. Whether it be the Judaizers or whether it be whatever, just from the world. And yet we have this promise, beloved, that there is a day coming when it will all be made right. You know, in Revelation it talks about every knee, or not in Revelation, it talks about in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. There will come a day when all, everybody out there that makes, how do I say this, that ridicules us for our faith and our belief, they will be brought, struck, dumb. They will see why we are loved and they will see why we love the Christ. And whatever's upside down will be made right and it will be clear. Mike this morning in Hebrews chapter 11 Reference in the heroes of faith. I thought, boy, this describes it to a T. If I get there, I should be able to quote it, and I think I could, but I don't want to mess it up. Hebrews 11, where it said, in uh, starting in verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings. You ever had? You ever been cruelly mocked? Yeah. Yeah, certain people know you're a believer. They get right on your case about it. Cruel mocking, scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in, in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. But here's the key of whom the world was not worthy. That's us. That's us. Not because of us, but because of the Lord. Amen. That's us. Mike, thanks for sharing that. It just really, it, it, it kicked with me. There we go. That's what we're talking about. Those in the synagogue of Satan, they'll come a day where they'll see all of that. And they'll be forced to view that. And they'll be forced to, to uh, bow the knee. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Without apologies, I am going to make a statement that I am very much pre trib and I know that opens the door up to those that are mid-trib and those that are post-trib and those that are no-trib and, and the whole nine yards. But if there is a clear understanding of what's going to happen before the tribulation happens, it is in this promise right here. I will keep them from the hour of temptation. That is speaking of the great tribulation. That is also in view for the church of Smyrna. And the Lord is allowing a little short time frame there of temptation, but they're kept from it also. So the, the Christians of Philadelphia, as well as us, are promised that if we are faithful and if we hold to the faith, we will be kept from that our tribulation. We're going to be out of here. I often hear people talk about how bad tribulation is going to be and all that's going to occur and everything. And I must confess in my mind, I'm going to say, I'm not going to be here to witness it. I'm not going to be here to experience it. We will often say, as bad as things are now, we must be in the middle of the tribulation. They were saying that you know, 15 years after Christ was crucified, when they were being hung and, and crucified and sawn asunder and all this stuff we read about in Hebrews. They thought they were in the tribulation. I think what that points out, beloved, is we can't conceive how bad it's going to be for the world. 
in the tribulation. Praise God, we're not going to have to experience that. It should also be noted in the wording here where it says, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. It doesn't just mean that going to be um, delivered from the trial, but they are going to be taken away from. They're not going to have to view it from afar or anything like that. It is a all or nothing scenario. They will be removed. Verse 11. And I think this is a verse that sometimes gets misinterpreted. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. When the Lord says, I come quickly, and the world looks at that and says, Psh, well, that's an empty promise. Look at this, 2,200 years have gone. He hasn't came. Boy, that's not quick. That's not what the word means in the Greek. What the word means is something that will happen suddenly. That's what quickly means. It doesn't mean he's coming today. Well, I mean, it could mean he's coming today. I don't want to discourage that thinking at all. But it simply means when it happens, you're not going to have a chance to pack your bag and think about it. It's going to be quick. Boop. It's done. It's over. And let that be something to put in your mind if you don't know the Savior this morning. When you see the rapture, or when you see all of a sudden empty seats and the Christians are gone, it's, it's too late to make a decision for Christ at that point. Quickly means exactly that. Now, suddenly, instantaneously, if you don't know Christ and you're depending on some point in the future being able to make that decision just before it happens, you're lost. You're lost today. You're going to be lost then. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day while you still can make that decision for Christ. <clears throat> Last part of that verse says, hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. He's urging the believers to keep a firm grip not on the crown but to keep a firm grip on the truth and the loyalty that they have to him. That's what he's referring to. If they do that, that crown cannot be snatched out of their hand. You and I are not holding desperately on to a crown somewhere that we might have in eternity. We're going to cast at the Lord's feet anyway if we have earned any. The point being that our faithfulness and our loyalty to Christ is going to guarantee that crown cannot be removed. That's where the promise lies. I think the Apostle Paul understood this well. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 9 and 24 and 26 where Paul writes this Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown we do it for an incorruptible and this is Paul's saying, statement. Therefore I so run, not as uncertainly, so fight, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, then bring it, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means which I have preached otherwise, I myself should be 
cast away. Paul knew where he was headed, and Paul knew what ministry he had from the Lord. And Paul knew that he would only achieve that crown. How do I say this? If he played by the rules, if he was faithful, and if he kept everything focused on Christ. Period. And so that's where our promise is. We can take that to heart. That we are faithful. The crown that we have is ours. Verse 12. He that overcometh <clears throat> will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him my new name. Final promise from the Lord to the Philadelphia believers. As he made a final promise to all of the believers in all of the churches. There's an assurance of a continuance of a life in eternity from Christ himself and it's from him that we're allowed to overcome the world and everything in it. It's interesting that here Christ says, I will make a pillar in the temple. If you recall in the various churches, Christ used something that was peculiar in their region or in their city that re they could relate to as a descriptive. Uh, the, the church of uh, Laodicea, neither hot nor cold, their water was tepid. It was, it was, and, and he said, and, and they could understand what he was saying when he said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just there. You notice earlier when I was giving a description of Philadelphia, they were subject to a lot of earthquakes and their buildings kept falling down except for the buildings that had pillars, solid pillars that held the buildings up. Christ is using a word picture that they know. Oh, Christ is going to make us pillars in the church of God, in the building. And they understood that. And I think that's really neat that the Lord, knowing our bent, sometimes will just give us a simple word picture. This is the way it is. You understand a pillar? Yeah, you do because you had the roof falling on top of you. I'm going to make you as a pillar so the roof will not fall in on top of you. Furthermore, in that promise is given, he shall go no more out. I think that means that the believer will no longer be subjected to all of the temptations of the world. Once we are in eternity and once we are in, we are home, if I may say that, we have no more temptation. We have nothing else pulling against us or beating against us or beating us down. I think that's where the reference shall go no more out. And then at the end of the verse, the Lord gives them a threefold assurance that they, the believers of Philadelphia, that we as believers at Westside Bible Chapel, the assurance will be identified with God. Number one, they will have the name of God. Number two, they will have the name of the city of God being New Jerusalem, and number three, they will have a new name belonging to Christ. An amazing thought that there is a coming day when my identity will be 100% in Christ and with the Father. And this is the assurance that we have. Lastly, verse 13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Same ending in all the other messages, challenging the believers of the Philadelphia church to heed what the Spirit says. Didn't we hear something this morning about the Spirit and the ministry, worship in the Spirit? So as we, as we wrap up this morning, as we come to a conclusion 
of the seven churches have we heard have we heard what the spirit has said as I have said in the past in all seven churches somewhere in those descriptions there was a descriptive that described us and there has been a um, uh, there has been pictures that were pictures of us it has been a waste of time if we have gone through this two-year study in the seven churches if it's been an intellectual exercise absolute waste of time elders I'm out of here thanks for the opportunity sayonara baby if we consider it for our spiritual good then it's been worthwhile that's where it all rests and, and I cannot say to you Luke Luke, are you having a closer walk with the Lord now because of studying and that? No, that's not my responsibility. It's Luke before a holy God with the Spirit directing him. It's all of us. Where am I at today after hearing this ministry from Jesus Christ on the seven churches? You know, it's interesting. We all want to think that we're like that church in Philadelphia. No problems. Everything's great. We're really the perfect church. Eh. No. We're imperfect people. You know the old saying, if you want to get rid of the problems in the church, get rid of the people. Because that's where the problems are. We are an imperfect people. But it's important to note how much we'd like to say we're like the Philadelphian church that there were believers in all seven churches. Just as today in Wichita, Kansas, there are believers smattered about in every degree of church that we're aware of. We need to realize that that is the body of Christ. And we need to realize how it pleases the Lord in this unity of the body of believers. Our application as we close, we're faithful, hold fast to doctrinal truths. We'll be able to withstand all the false, false doctrine that is out there. We'll be able to keep, and, and I want to be careful here. <clears throat> it's always said it's the elder's responsibility to keep false doctrine from creeping in wrong. It's our responsibility. Every one of us individually, the elders have oversight and the elders offer protection but beloved we need to be good Bereans we need to, to I mean everything I'm saying this morning you need to hold up to scripture is it valid is it God breathed is it doctrinally correct that responsibility lies with all of us but we take to heart all the all the warnings all the promises and might we truly apply to our lives what the Spirit saith to the seven churches. Father, thank you for your love. Father, thank you for the, your truth and the truth of your Son. Thank you, Father, for blessing us beyond measure. Truly, we are a blessed people. My only prayer now that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And my second prayer would be, if anything has been said that is of no eternal value, that it would just be taken out of our minds and, and burnt up in a puff of smoke. We commit ourselves in the worthy and precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.